what we're dealing with here is something so profound that the changes that it's going to bring are not the kind of thing that the government can alter. Technology produces wonderful new tools. But what is loss in their wake? It's a question society is always facing, even if it's not always conscious of it. For my people over 35, how many of your kids will ever write more than a few sentences in cursive? Will they ever even learn to write in cursive? No. Today's generation grows up with iPhones, iPads, TikTok, Roblox, and an internet that looks nothing like version 1.0 when you had to surf the web via your telephone landline. I wonder if there's a Gen Z reacts to GeoCities pages video out there somewhere. And listen, I host a technology podcast and I run a business news publication covering startups and technology innovation. I have spent my whole life exploring technology. But as I grow older, I find myself more and more grateful that I was born before the modern technology explosion to experience and appreciate what preceded it. Because things are speeding up. And as we've discussed on several podcasts now, generative AI is the first little tease of a new epoch. I'm sure you fiddled around with ChatGPT by now. We did. Or produced your own The Movie 2001 but is played by Muppets images. Businesses are playing around with these tools too. CNET has recently started using generative AI to produce news articles, and the Associated Press has been using AI tools since 2014. And we know Microsoft is chomping at the bit to integrate open AI tech into everything from Bing to Clippy. Clippy lives. Generative AI can be a wonderful tool. What will be lost in its wake? On the podcast this week is Stephen Marsh, Canadian novelist, essayist, and cultural commentator. He's been doing some interesting work with Canadian startup Cohere, which he discusses on this podcast, but it's his writing that prompted me to ask him on the show. Marsh has been all over the place writing thoughtful pieces on AI in the Globe and Mail about how Bill C-27 fails to understand AI and thus how to regulate it and in The Atlantic about how nobody is prepared for how AI is going to transform academia. Why? Well, for probably a lot of reasons, but certainly because the college essay is dead. Now you have two technology writers talking about writing in academia. I know. Worse still, he's a king's guy, I'm a hums kid. But please, trust me, this conversation is extremely important. If only to understand how much STEM and the liberal arts need each other right now and how both are wholly unprepared to engage with each other. Because again, this conversation is not new. Socrates was talking about the destructive power of technology more than 2,000 years ago. If humanity learns to write, it will implant forgetfulness in their souls. They will cease to exercise memory because they rely on that which is written, calling things to remembrance no longer from within themselves, but by means of external marks. What you have discovered is not a recipe for memory, but for a reminder. Here's the kicker. The only reason we know that is because Plato wrote it down. Shit is complicated. Let's dig in. Okay, Stephen, you wrote an op-ed in the Globe and Mail recently about some of the problems with the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act, how it is both too vague and too severe. I don't want to talk about any of that. We had Carol Piovizen on to explain all of that to us a few episodes ago. What I what do, did she say? Did she agree with me? She said very smart things in, in rapid fire. She's a consummate lawyer. Uh, I recommend you check out that episode. But what I do want to talk about is your thoughts on the motivation behind the regulation. Because something in that Globe op-ed stuck out to me where you said that the federal government is trying to do to artificial intelligence, what it should have done to social media 10 years ago. But these technologies are not alike. They're different cases with different requirements requiring different regulatory frameworks. As someone who went through social media over the last 10 years and, and experienced both maybe the excitement, anticipation now, the, the general dread, I'm wondering, what did we learn from not regulating social media before the damage was done? And how should we be approaching regulating emergent technologies now, AI or otherwise? 
Well, I mean, they're very different scenarios because we have very different information environments about what we know about these things, right? About not only about how they work, but what their effects are. Like I wrote a piece for the Atlantic in 2012 called this Facebook making us lonely, which is one of the first looks into like the social consequences of Facebook. And it was clear even then that social media had some very deleterious social consequences and that it had correlations with depression. It had correlations with loneliness and basically no one cared and no one wanted to deal with it because it was a huge problem. And it seemed like regulating tech industries just seemed too hard. It was also very hard to figure out how to do it in the context of freedom of speech, in the context of the first amendment, particularly in the United States, where you were trying to find a legal way to regulate speech when, you know, you're just talking about people talking. How are you going to do that? Now, of course, we've seen the consequences of social media on society and politics and so on. And those questions don't seem anywhere near as pressing as how does we how do we stop this from, you know, making teenage girls kill themselves and so on and destroying American democracy. I think with Facebook and with social media generally, we were way too shy about regulating them. And we were way too shy about understanding them as social forces. I mean, I actually have quite a lot of sympathy for the bureaucrats trying to get a handle on AI because it is a huge ethical problem and it's it's very complex and they have a really tough situation. But AI is not the kind of thing where we understand the consequences at all the same way that we did with social media 10, 11 years ago. It's a much more mysterious technology. They're trying to regulate the internal workings of the algorithms, which is fruitless, uh, ultimately pointless. And, you know, so what they're doing instead of coming up with practical solutions is what I said in the article, like a virtue blob. They're just throwing big numbers at these things with very vague pronouncements and, you know, everything is to be determined later in the regulations. Well, that, that's not very helpful, right? That's not very helpful to people building businesses. It's not, it's also not very helpful for people who actually want to understand what possible regulations of AI should be. So I think there's a just kind of a feeling like, well, we messed up with social media. We didn't act quickly enough. So let's get on this right now. But, you know, actually I'm of the opinion that certainly the way that they're doing it is not an approach that has a lot of understanding of how AI actually functions particularly these large language models and the transformer-based artificial intelligence. I just think it's not a piece of legislation that actually knows what it's legislating about. I agree with that generally and I understand your point. I'm wondering if maybe we can parse stepping away from ADA, but then what the correct approach to regulating emergent technologies is. Because I take your point that there were certain things about social media that were obvious and transparent to see. But I would also say that it hasn't been until recently, let's say 2019 on, that we've really truly understood how far reaching the technology is, like the transformative power at scale when everyone's using social media. And I would also say harm against young people, mental health are are strong considerations. But there's just some basic stuff around, it seemed like governments would view something done on Facebook, let's say ad targeting or political ads, things like that, which we already had a structure for, for traditional media, but then somehow technology was a magic box where everything was radically different. And we weren't just applying the same concepts to new formats. There was somehow the, the smoke and powder and the whiz bang of technology somehow prevented us from just seeing like core fundamental things where it's like, well, well, if you were to take an ad out, a political ad out on TV, it would have to be disclosed where the money was coming from, who the organization was. There's all these requirements. Why? Just because it's a, a JPEG that goes across the internet, it should be any different. And agreeing with you to the government's credit, they're trying to get in early to carve boxes around approaches and set maybe um, categories of responsibility for that behavior. <laughs> I'm wondering, is that is that the right approach or should we, like, why as a society should we wait and see how a technology messes with that society before we regulate it? Well, it's not a question of seeing how it messes with the society. It's a question of what are you actually regulating? In the case of AI, these pleas for transparency, for instance, you know, they are completely missing the point of AI, which is that the power of this technology is that it solves problems that are not transparent. I mean, when you're dealing with 
GPT-3, which has 175 billion parameters, speaking of meaningful transparency on a program like that is really pretty fictional. It's not something that, that can be done. Well, I certainly don't have a solution to how to regulate AI that is definitely above my pay grade, like by a large measure. I would say that it is going to have to be a legislation of outcomes rather than processes, which is what they're trying to do here, right? They're trying to legislate the actual algorithms in use, which is just not um, particularly valid. You asked before, like, why didn't we use traditional means to regulate the internet? I mean, if we'd used traditional means to regulate, like, a GIF, they wouldn't have existed, right? Because, like, you would have had to pay copyright on it, and you would have had, like, and you would, like, it would have just killed the internet from the very beginning, right? Which no one wanted to do, and also because everyone knew that it was coming one way or the other, right? I just feel that this legislation doesn't actually understand what they're talking, like, what artificial intelligence is. It's not a question of like that there should not be regulation or anything like that. Of course there should be. But like when you're dealing with deep learning systems, you're dealing with abyssal systems that you're never going to get a fully comprehensible thing that you can therefore regulate the algorithm of. You're going to have to regulate outcomes, which is, I, I think, entirely appropriate and would probably actually just be welcomed by everybody. Let's stick with this idea of regulating the process versus the outcomes. And I think that's where the social media versus AI comparison really takes hold because we would have gone very, very far and we still actually could, whether it is with social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or even things like Amazon, Audible, Spotify, if there was a greater disclosure and visibility as to how those systems worked. But also if we knew the outcomes, right, and those outcomes were reported. The process of Facebook or Instagram or whatever, I, I mean, that to me is less relevant than the fact that it has these consequences. Yes, yeah, to the point. I'm, so there's a great new book out right now by Cory Doctorow and Rebecca Giblin called Choke Point Capitalism, just talking about how much money could be going to content creators right now through Spotify, Audible or whatever, if we actually required a system in place to disclose who should be getting paid, like actually who owned the rights, how many streams were being listened to, and that there was a, a centralized system for paying out royalties, which we currently don't have, which we used to use again when the format was vinyl or tape, like just again, digitally, we just created this um, intentional black box that doesn't need to be, which is very different from the AI standpoint. I agree with you that we don't really care about what the outcome is on Facebook, almost to the point where like we, it's just bad, just that all the outcomes are bad. So it's a little bit more like let's open up on the process and we know downstream we will have less negative, more enjoyable outcomes. Although, you know, to be fair to Facebook, they've been begging for regulation for a long time. You know, like I wrote is Facebook being guess I've been following this story for a long time. There's a lot of terrible consequences. Like they keep going to Washington and say, hey, guys, Give, like regulate us, please. The people in office in Washington do not know what they're talking about. They're still in the 70s. Part of the reason why they're begging for that regulation is because th there is no reason why a publicly traded company like Meta would choose to shackle itself competitively in the global market. So there needs to be that regulatory uh, component there to just have companies competing on equal terms, not competing to have the best monopoly, right? Now, in, in AI, <laughs> I, I feel like and with generative technology specifically, this is where we get to a point where it's very interesting where it kind of doesn't matter what companies are looking for or wanting, because if the generative capabilities are out there, that's like the actual genie in the bottle. The, the outcome is the process a little bit, and it, it won't really matter what company owns a foothold in selling the service if there are other opportunities out there for generative tech, which I'm wondering if you feel like, you know, to your point, like they're going to need to look at the outcomes here and they want to look at the process. If Shouldn't we be looking at some deeper level if we can't understand how the decisions were made generatively, that we at least need to stamp all generative tech, generative AI as that so it can be recognized for a misinformation standpoint, for an uh, ethics standpoint, like there's already been psychologists who've been testing generative counseling. Yeah, it doesn't work very well. Yeah, it doesn't work very well, but it also yeah. raises a lot of really serious questions about why <laughs> why they wanted to experiment in that way. It, it, do you see other angles here? Because I feel like 
I'm really concerned about what's coming out of the bottle right now. Yeah. I'm just going to make a suggestion to you that the governments of this world are not going to be able to do much about this. The, the questions that we're facing now, like sometimes I feel like when I'm, when I'm writing about this stuff, what I get is these traditional hopes and anxieties, right? Like you get this hope for artificial general intelligence, like artificial consciousness, which is just absurd. Like no one who uses this stuff for 10 minutes or anyone involved in it thinks it's one step closer than a pocket calculator to an artificial general intelligence. Then you have these anxieties like, like it's going to replace artists or something like that. Like it's going to be the mechanical all for language. I mean, I just don't see that at all. I mean, like the San Francisco Opera Company did an AI generated campaign. They had to use 30 designers. Like what we're dealing with here is something so profound that the changes that it's going to bring are not the kind of thing that the government can alter. Like much like the Internet, like the Internet can be regulated and you can do certain things with it. But like generative AI technologies are such a profound shift in how we think of questions like what is language what is a human being what is originality what is the difference between a human and a machine just as a casual thing like the turing test which was an obsession is just obviously one of the greatest intellectual red herrings of all time completely irrelevant overnight well that was a absolutely silly way to think about computation and consciousness like relegated to the scrap heap of history overnight that's one tiny thing about this right and i would also say like i was using generative ai to do stuff for like wired in like 2017 and the generative ai that we're seeing right now is toy cases like it's toy use cases it's cool things to do on your phone if you're bored the actual uses of this for analytic functions have barely been touched. And they're going to be m massive. They're just going to be vast. They're going to be absolutely enormous. And like, no one is even thinking about that. I mean, I, like, I just think like, it's so funny to me that like chat GPT brought this story to everyone's when it's like, it's not a very good version of this. It's, it's not even their best version. Of it's it. not. It really isn't. Like if you go to pseudo write to write an essay on pseudo write is way easier than chat GPT and it's much more effective. Like there's going to be things like that where they're going to brand everything that's that's AI generated, but you know, you're going to get that text and then you're going to be able to fool around with it and change it a little bit. I mean, when I wrote the piece about the college essay is dead for the Well, for that's the, that's what I want to get to, right? Because cuz we just identified with the Turing test like it's it's impossible for us to see over the horizon line. And I don't think that can reasonably be expected, but we can acknowledge when something is rapidly accelerating to the horizon line faster than we've ever seen before and want to do something about it. I actually think that the op-ed that you wrote in The Atlantic, geez, another op-ed, you're just writing everywhere but beta kit right now. This is hurting my feelings <laughs> about essentially how- How much how, money you guys got? <laughs> we, have, we have budget. We can <laughs> send me an email, man. You essentially wrote this uh, op-ed in The Atlantic, which we'll link to about how AI is about to transform academia by killing the college essay. And I think this is a really good example, a current example for us to ground on, because this is another one of those things that is immediately transformative. It's not the only thing that generative AI is going to kill. You mentioned Wired, CNET is already experimenting with generative news reports. The Associated Press has been using it for a while for like financial statements and stuff. As a creator myself, I believe the music and visual arts is going to be heavily impacted already because they have no financial leg to stand on. But you know, this academia or this part of academia is kind of your ballywick. So I'm hoping you can explain your thinking and maybe just describe for our audience that is mostly tech focused what academia is dealing with right now. And then maybe we'll get into a conversation about why it was so bad that science and math separated from the humanities, because as a humanities student myself, that's all I want to talk about, right? Right. I mean, and it was, that is the big catastrophe that like, that's why we have this disaster that we're facing, right? And that's why Facebook was such a disaster. That's why social media was such a catastrophe. Yeah, dropping out but, of school is never cool, guys. Well, you know, it's fine to drop out of school, but like do some, read some Shakespeare anyway. Like don't just read Lord of the Rings, man. Like read some Borges or something. Well, but, I, but also part of the reason is that they've been reading these books that uh, were dystopias and thinking that they were blueprints. But talk us through why exactly is the college essay dead? Like I've been doing basically the same thing since I was six years old, which is like, here's an idea, write sentences about it, write blocks of sentences and paragraphs, write them in structures and in, in arguments and put them together. I'm very good at it. I make a living at it. 
the way I was taught that was by high school and junior high school and university being continuously demanded to write essays. In high school, 400 word, 500 word pieces, 1000 word pieces maybe. At university, the 1500 word piece, then the 5000 word piece, then graduate school, the 5000 word piece, right? What ChatGPT can do is give you a first draft. Like that's how I would think of it. Like I would like people are like thinking about it used directly to cheat, like just like you have it write it for you. But that's not what I see as being replaced. Like what I see being replaced is like you're there in front of a blank page and you've got to come up with something. Right? You gotta come up with some basic idea. And Chat GPT is just superb at that. I don't think people students are gonna cheat, they're just gonna have it right, but they're gonna have like, okay, give me a first draft and then I'll work off of that. Also, you know. The thing is, like, ChatGPT is going to give really good answers. Like, take the take-home test, which is not necessarily in English departments where I'm from, but for things like law school and things like, especially MBAs, that's a very common way of grading people. And that's gone. Most of my final exams at the College of Humanities were take-home essays or some component of that. And let's let's dig into this because I think you're giving a lot of credit to students now who won't use it for cheating. They'll use it for a first draft. Whether or not that's technically considered cheating right now is, is a little bit up in the air. It needs to be... Um, in New York, it is. They already said it is. You're not to use it in any way. And And I'm wondering if we can separate... What universities are using these written assignments, whether essays or take-home exams, as uh, to do as evaluation criteria? And then the virtue of the process of writing in and of itself. Because at least for me, as a student who went to an interdisciplinary liberal arts program, the reason why we did that wasn't because it was silly to do shorter written exams or things like that in a, in a gymnasium or something. It's that the process of drafting those essays were to construct thought, to hone your capacity to make an argument. And particular to my program, a little bit separate from say like the traditional English or history or poli sci paper, they weren't really looking for deep research essays, pulling together a bunch of topics. It was single text exegesis. You were responsible for taking a platonic argument, reading some Boethius, re-articulating. Did you do FIP? Did you do foundation year? No, I studied the College of Humanities at Carleton. Oh, okay. I did King's. I did foundation year program at King's. Yeah, I just did program. three Same more thing. years of what you were doing. And th that process was, was one of evaluating not how well written the paper was, but how well constructed my argument was. And it taught me how to think. There was no cheating on that paper. You could hand the book back in and say, no one can do it better, or you could reconstruct in your own words. And I don't think most paper, I would hope that most universities see in some implicit way the value of that process, the, the generative capabilities of learning how to think and communicate and just bludging that into you. But I, I think most university programs are saying, this is just a showcase of the work that you did because you can't cheat 3,000 words. You're going to have to go into the library. You're going to have to read some things. You're going to have to mash it about a bit. And whether it's well-written or not, bake in the friggin' cake showcases that you did the work. And, and that seems to be right out of the window. It's not just that. It's like when you write something, you have to go and find out what sources are, how sources work how they relate to each other, which ones are valid, which ones aren't, which ones are useful, which ones have reputation behind them. You have to figure out how to construct an argument down to a thesis, how to extra extrapolate that into a series of related arguments. And that is the, how we teach people now to think. Right at this moment, but like before, you know, this stuff becomes normal, that right now, that's how we teach ordinary people how to think through things. Certainly right? pre-Google. I would say since Google, you kind of do a bit of that, but you look up Wikipedia a little bit and then you try to do that in more detail. So we've- Google's we're also just a source. Google, Wikipedia is just like an encyclopedia. It is, but but again, for from a technological standpoint, the speed and the scale at which you can access the encyclopedia is a little bit different because you don't- Well, that's true. But it, ultimately it's the same process. You look at what the materials are out there, you think about them, you compare them, you generate your own ideas, and then you have a raw page that you put them down on, right? And it's that that's the process that's going to be removed, the raw page part. And that is how we think through things, right? That is how we come up with original thinking. You know, part of me is like, well, this is just a tool, right? I mean, you know, one of the students who was caught using this in New Zealand, they said, 
Well, I'm not cheating because I'm not using somebody else's work. I'm using a tool like a thesaurus, like spell check. One thing I did, I wouldn't say I got wrong in that piece, but I think I underestimated how quickly the universities would respond. They are responding relatively quickly. They have figured out that this is a major threat. Because they're already identifying students using them, right? They're already finding students using it. Hey, founders, are you considering building your startup on AWS? From A to support to Neo Financial, Canada's top startups build on AWS but they don't do it alone. So whether you're looking for help solving a technical challenge, hiring the right engineers, or finalizing a fundraising round, AWS has all the resources you need to get started. There's a reason more startups build on AWS than any other provider. AWS is here to help you succeed from inception to IPO. To learn more or to start your cloud journey, go to www.aws.amazon.com startups. It's it's weird that this would kind of be the tipping point where academia would would learn to honestly, to their credit, maybe this is a key learning that they've had since COVID. And now it seems like they're on it. And, I, and I'm wondering if to again, parsing what's really going to be like what baby is going to be thrown out with this bathwater. Are they more concerned about losing the tool that is predominantly used as a training method to teach thought? communication and understanding, like really the principal one, particularly in, in programs and classes at scale where it's like one professor and maybe a couple TAs for 300 students, or are they more concerned about losing their grading efficiencies? Because honestly, the best exam I ever took was an oral exam. Yeah, I think where they're going to come back. I have a friend who's a professor who said he's gone right to it, oral exams. I think there are going to be a lot of things like that in class essays oral exams, things of that nature. We can no longer trust the proxies of indicating you've done the yes. work. Yes. I mean, the other option is, of course, much longer form, right? Like it's much harder to use this generative technology on 3,000 word pieces than it is for 1,000 word pieces. You would have to stitch it together in some in a very precise way that would require a lot of thinking to do anyway. They're going to adapt and they're going to find ways to adapt. and. The problem here is that they're not seeing what a glorious opportunity this is. There is a real way here where humanities are going to be absolutely essential to uh, this technological revolution. And not only that, but this technology is potentially illuminating of humanity scholarship in a way that I see no one considering. No one. Like, you have a machine that has a perfect hermeneutical system inside it. You know, one of the earliest pieces I wrote for The New Yorker about it was getting it to write the end of Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, like getting it to finish that great unfinished poem, which it did perfectly. I mean, it did in a completely convincing way. Like if you told me that Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote it, I mean, that was the... Perfectly and convincingly aren't necessarily synonyms, but I but I hear you. I And, and even going back to your point previously about, you know, for me, the compelling thing about ChatGPT isn't its drafting function. It's its search function. Because rather than a list of articles, you can use it to connect you to every translation of a platonic dialogue in service of better understanding. I remember reading a Google publication, like a scholarly publication that they wrote once they got Palm above like I forget what it was. Once they get, once they had Lambda, once they had like, once they had their own AI, which of course I've never seen, uh, that was of a, a serious parameter size, and they and they were producing passing the Turing test and so on. And they said that the two big questions are going to be facticity and personality, right? Those are going to be the future questions of these generators. I mean, that was like three, four years ago. So I wonder how far they've gotten. You know, I've already had tests with like, I had a test with an Israeli company that does a large language model that ties it to the internet. It provides exactly what ChatGPT does, but with sourcing. That's a completely different way to search, right? It gives you a coherent essayistic answer with citation to any question that you ask. That's a very different thing than going into Google and touching. I mean, I think when it goes with Bing, it could be incredible. I mean, it depends on the the cost, like using this technology is actually relatively expensive. So we don't know 
what that's going to mean. Well, there's a reason why uh, OpenAI is looking to get a, a huge sum of cash from Microsoft for this because servers are melting as we speak. But I want to yeah. I want to go back to the opportunity because in in your Atlantic article uh, and you had noted just a few moments ago that you had maybe been too pessimistic of academia's response. And you're noting that there's a real opportunity for the humanities, liberal arts, who have, which have seen just a dramatic reduction in the last 10 years. I feel like in a lot of certain ways, I was Indiana Jonesing my way out before the temple collapsed because, you know, digital technologies were emerging, but not in a way to attack the value of just a classical education. Can you explain why there is such a tension between the humanities and, let's say, STEM? where that's coming from and, and why it seems like they can't speak to each other. Because you touched upon that a little bit in the article, but it seems like the opportunity might not be grasped here because mom and dad are fighting. <laughs> like in, in the in human, in human discourse, mom and dad are not talking to each other anymore. Or there's two sides of the family that don't show up at the picnic anymore. And you have the arrogance of professors as being a major culprit. I mean, it goes back quite a ways. Like C.P. Snow wrote a piece called The Two Cultures. Uh, I think it was 1959, where he described this splitting away, which well, it really wasn't before then. Like, it was perfectly working. Like, Faraday had a very great liberal arts education. Certainly, Einstein knew huge amounts about literature and music and everything like that. It really started specializing, like, radically specializing in the 60s. And so you have this divide between essentially humanities, which went into a self critique yeah. and a self paralyzing. A critique of meta narratives and consumed itself. Shout out to Charles away. Taylor, another yeah. comedian. And well, I would say Leotard more, but they started shredding narratives and that was their job. And then you had scientists who became very performative and became very interested in engineered results and demonstrated experiments and so on. And meta questions became sort of tertiary, right? And that's not usually a problem. Like it, it, it is a problem when you have, like, I think you see the real consequences of that in what happened with social media, where you have, like, even when you have someone like Elon Musk, who, you know, people make fun of him, but he's obviously an extremely brilliant human being, right? Like uh, uh, right on the edge of human brilliance. And he, yeah, but he's also a, a first year poli sci dipshit, right? To counterbalance exactly. both sides of this. And that's exactly it. He actually doesn't consider humanistic questions to be worthy of inquiry. Like I had an engineering friend once who used to say to me, um, how are the book reports going? Right. Like that's what I did to him. I made book reports. Right. When you see his man mishandling of Twitter, it's because he doesn't have very basic understandings of concepts like parody, concepts like speech limitation. Wisdom of the crowd. They're that, serious questions. Yeah. Right. Like he thinks they're he thinks they're the things you talk about. When, in between doing serious work, making rockets, right? And in social media, obviously, that's been a disaster. When you look at, like, the incredible poverty of the understanding of society and history that the people who made Facebook evidenced, right? Like, they just have no idea how uh, society and history work, and they clearly didn't bother to inform themselves, even in the most negligible way. But when you get to this generative AI, particularly the language models and their incredible power um, where the really interesting questions here are fundamentally about language and how it works and how it means things to people and what it means and how it means and who is meaning you know if you don't have a humanistic education you're not going to understand the consequences and you're not gonna, I don't I think actually you're not going to understand the working okay so on one side we have a deep seated maybe almost two century arrogance from people who have, yeah. think no thought after Descartes is useful anymore, right? And then on the other side, you have the classicists who are, are about to leap into this moment and say, huzzah, worry not, we have the solution to society is ills and they're gonna lead and they're gonna organize and they're gonna teach everyone the things that they've been muddling about with forever, right? Like well, if, if no. on one side we have <laughs> arrogance, the other side we have a, a lack of confidence or um, a different type of social ineptitude, perhaps? I think we have an even more profound arrogance. I mean, it's <laughs> one of the great joys of my life that I've been working with engineers lately. I mean, there's so much better to work with. There's so much franker and humbler and more cheerful and they want to build things. I mean, I went to the MLA in 2018. I mean, the navel gazing is astonishing. 
Like, it's like, you guys are just not aware of what is going on in the world. Like, I mean, we cannot blame the engineers for the crisis the humanists find themselves in. Like, the humanists have made this bed of their own, you know, profound ignorance of uh, and, and refusal to engage with the, with the advent of these technologies, even as they are not only transforming the world, but transforming their fields from the ground up. And... I can sort of see a world where engineers come to understand the importance of the humanities. It's much harder for me to imagine a world where the humanists figure out that the technologies could be so great for them and that they should not respond to them with fear and loathing, but with like active engagement and some enthusiasm and some optimism. I mean, I would love to live in a world where I could see that happening, but I actually just don't see it. They're so closed off in these tiny gardens of inconsequence that even this stuff which is magical i mean it like i'm about, i'm writing a short story right now with engineers at cohere where it's based on prompts and then we've trained those prompts so it's the same story told coherently infinitely like think about that from a humanistic point of view like where it's the same story but it regenerates itself each time in a completely new way constantly what is that art like think about the well it's a video game consequence <laughs> well i guess so but it's also or it's, it's, or it's, the, or it's the gap between the 70s touring test and what we have now like it's it's that to that horizon light extension all i'm saying is there's unbelievably awesome things that is going to be made from this stuff that could be super cool it's funny when i go on podcasts like this people want to talk about fears and anxieties i feel like i'm got, i've had an early version of the electric guitar and it's just awesome. And I want to go out and figure out what we can do with this thing to make things that are so cool. Because I, I think things are going to be made with this stuff that are just going to be so cool. Let's close some loops with that, because I wish I could disagree with you on the academia point. But having run into my my program recently and trying to, to re-engage and just seeing how beaten down and self-conscious they are, I have a hard time agreeing with you that they're going to seize the moment. Because again, the only reason I'm coming to them saying there's a moment here is because when I left the cave and saw the light of the sun and then got a job working in tech, right? Like, But to your point of the excitement, I think this goes back to the very beginning of our conversation around what we've experienced over the last five to seven years and the desire to prevent that from happening. Whereas it's one thing to be given an electric guitar, it's another thing to instantaneously produce 8 billion electric guitars where you you can't escape the volume, right? And we are dealing with transformative technology at scales, at speeds, beyond anyone's control, even the people making it. And I feel like that is where the anxiety is coming from. Because if something as simple as 140 characters about your latte can turn into social media, what can this magic turn into? Because it's not individual experiences anymore. There are, there are certain things that inherently break at global scale, and we've been living with some of them. So to see something that breaks the normal other stuff that we've had, <laughs> I, th I think that's where that anxiety comes from. Well, the anxiety is really natural. We've just come through the social media revolution, which is a total catastrophe. Plus, we're dealing with a tech world that's like, like principally defined in a lot of minds by fraud, right? You got WeWork, you got Theranos, you got FDA, you know, you got a lot of nonsense out there, right? And certainly AI is just, the, the AI hype is just totally out of control. As I said, I was very skeptical very early about social media. I've never been a technophile. That's literally never been my position in this in, in any debate of any kind. Because, you know, the other thing about misinformation is we're already there. People talk about this stuff as putting it on steroids. Well, it's already on steroids. Whether a lie is written by a machine or a human is really not relevant compared to how it spreads down the networks by people believing it, people promoting things that they know aren't true. All I'm saying is that I, I don't think we should assume that this technology is going to be as toxic as social media just because social media came last. It's going to have good effects. It's going to have bad effects. It has huge ethical questions into it. There's no question about that. But let's not lose sight of that there is something potentially really transformatively beautiful in this. I think the fact that it's being used for art is actually kind of revealing, right? Like the use case here is like people making really cool posters with it. Well, this is the alpha testing though. So at the risk of running back 
half of the podcasts that we've recorded on this channel over the course of the years, I think I, I can connect it because it's not just that the last technological age went sour. It's that we saw information as it became infinite and abundant be turned into a commodity. And when it's turned into a commodity, it's speculated against uh, to the point where misinformation and disinformation can be more valuable than accurate information, truth, even facts, right? And we've also experienced how dangerous that stuff can be even when we know it's misinformation and disinformation. We have no systemic barriers against that kind of stuff. We are about to enter an environment where we, unless this technology is fundamentally altered right now, and there's conversations about marking this stuff, where it'll be impossible to know <laughs> if it was misinformation or disinformation because the uh, appeal to fact and the confidence with which, like the confidence with which ChatGPT is wrong, even for like basic math is is impressive, right? It hallucinates all the time. Yes. But if we have a problem with information as a society that a five seconds of Googling will tell you is inaccurate, how are we supposed to then, the anxiety comes from, the, how are we going to handle the thing that we can't even tell is whatever? Because I see Plato memes on the internet all the time. You know, Plato always said, you don't know what you got till it's gone. You got to know and hold them. And I'm like, those aren't quotes, man. But the meme layers are so deep that it becomes very hard to Snopes that stuff. And we're now talking about mass scale hallucinations. This is Philip K. Dick stuff. I may give you a very scholarly answer. This is a very scholarly answer, which you, you might hate. I think you probably will hate, but it, anyway, it's scholarly. Um, my <laughs> PhD was on 17th century English drama and, and religion. And, you know, during that period, there was the rise of the pamphlet culture, right? And pamphlets culture annihilated truth in England. And they regulated it in France. They didn't regulate it in England. It had incredibly vicious social consequences that led to this huge religious fracturing and it ultimately led to the civil war right like it was one of the major consequences of the civil war in in england in the mid-17th century the way they got out of that was not by ending pamphlets and it was partly by having a king's mark but it, it wasn't really that the way they got out of it was by founding the royal society the way they got out of it was by founding institutions boring fuddy-duddy institutions that validated information and people slowly over time realizing that the value of real information was higher than that of poor information. And I, I have to say that was built by very heroic people who put effort into it, who fought for accuracy through institutions and built institutions with money with painstaking labor of actually building meaningful communities through institutions to build that. I mean, the part, the problem here is not necessarily this technology. The problem is that we're living in a, a society where the institutions are falling apart. And th those are perhaps not unrelated phenomenon, but I just wrote a book about the possibility of a civil war in the United States. When you look at public trust in all institutions of all kinds, it is in collapse. I don't think chat GPT is or is contributing to that. In fact, I don't think social media is contributing to it. It, it started in the 70s. Like, without public institutional trust, of course this stuff explodes. The thing to focus on here is not necessarily how do you regulate something that's fundamentally unregulatable. It doesn't matter what these guys doing ADA are thinking. Like, it's not going to have any consequences on at all on how this works out. It's just, it, it's only going to have a consequence on whether it happens in Toronto or San Francisco. I feel like, even as a reporter, I feel like in Toronto, I'm ahead of this story by about two years. And I feel like the, the, the AI community here is ahead by two years. Are we going to use that? Are we going to blow that two years on this virtue blob, which ultimately will have no consequences and is not a sophisticated understanding of this technology that's going to transform it for the better? Or are they going to just going to do it in London and San Francisco? I mean, that's really what the, what the question of that article was well, about. Yeah. And I'll note, you mentioned Cohere earlier, uh, your Globe story references Aiden Gomez and the work being done at Google's offices in Mountain View, and the creation of the Transformers and the chat GPT, right? So I think your point's well taken. And I think you made a lot of really great Canadian Heritage Moment references <laughs> in that piece. And, and the, yeah. you know, is this going to be 
our <laughs> our Ken Dryden episode, or is this going to be our Avro Arrow uh, exactly. episode? I, I think is well taken, but I also feel like that is relative to the human experience on this isolated planet. Like you were you were referencing two European countries in a century where the pain of that new technology was physically limited, and and the the pains of these technologies uh, are are not. I mean, the pain of the pamphlets, I mean, a third of Ireland died because of those pamphlets, right? Like, I mean, w- w- like, it, like it was, it was massively spread. Like it had, it, it came, it, it came on them like wildfire. I mean, they were not. I, I agree. And now the pamphlets don't have to be physically distributed. So I guess maybe to, to close this out, I got a lot of questions I want to ask you. We're going to have to get you to, to write some more stuff. You, you feel like you're kind of two years ahead here and what you were just speaking to of like, it's going to happen here or the really smart Canadians at universities in, in Toronto, Montreal, and uh, Calgary are just going to get paid by U.S. companies to do it elsewhere. Is Should we be talking right now about maybe if we're not regulating the technology, we're regulating things or enforcing support of institutions? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a opposed to regulation. I mean, God knows we need to regulate AI. I mean please do not walk away with the impression that I'm like deregulate this thing. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, but we, it it cannot be vague and random with massive fines for very unspecified things that actually are not really recognizable in the technology. It has to be a regulation. I, I mean, I believe, and I'm taking that from other people like Jeffrey Hinton, that it has to be a regulation of outcomes. I think that's the the fundamentally the meaningful way that it is going to be regulated. I think meaningful regulation where it was actually set and it was and it was established and it was useful and it was clear would be an advantage. Like I think that wouldn't hurt us at all. I think it would be the opposite. It would be like, well, we now we know where we are here. God knows what's going to happen in Europe and the states. But this vague thing about like massive fines for violations of regulations to be determined later not helpful. And then potentially as scary from a civil society standpoint. So I guess let, let's actually close on this. If you had an audience with Minister Champagne, he subscribes to the podcast, I'm sure. If, if he missed this episode, what would you tell him? What would you want him to take away from this? Is it to drop ADA from the bill entirely and scope out something, use this two-year window to do something different? Would you advise that he read a couple books? Look, I mean, I would say I have core advice that's probably not very useful and I have direct advice. I mean, the, the, the core advice is like, do not squander this opportunity. Like, just recognize that we are in a world where the wealth of a country is fundamentally the technology that emerges from it. This is not an opportunity that we can waste. It's not like the Avro era where, you know, we just won't have a, uh, you know, we, we just, all our scientists will go to NASA. Like, this will impoverish us in some fundamental way in the future. And there's not another one coming down the pike. Like, understand that this is the opportunity. And, you know, for the most part, the Trudeau government has been superb at bringing engineers in, at building us up as a tech sector. I mean, I, that's why I find this quite mysterious in, in, in some fundamental way. But the other thing is, like, I do think this ADA has to be dropped and a new uh, regulatory framework around outcomes has to be established, which I don't think is necessarily that complicated to do. Like, I think it's a lot easier to regulate outcomes than it is to regulate systems, especially AI systems, which are fundamentally mysterious, right? That would be my advice. I would also say that I don't envy him, that I think that the the regulators who are doing this have a very hard job. It is not something that is to be taken like, oh, these idiots, what are they? They, they have, like, this is a very pressing problem that is extremely complicated. And it's not the kind of thing where it's like, oh, if only they would do X, it would be all be solved. I don't think that's realistic at all. And I think it's very easy to, you know, shit all over bureaucrats who are trying to do something that's really important. And it's not fair. I'm not so arrogant to think that I have the answer. I'm just pretty sure this is not the answer. I'm, I'm sure this is not the answer. Well, we'll leave it at that. And then if you come up with any better answers, we're going to get you to publish it on Betacade or maybe have you back on the Betacade podcast. Stephen, I, I really appreciate this. This has been great. And uh, I can't wait to send this to all my fellow hums alum to dig into maybe five to eight of the in-jokes that we had that only liberal arts majors will enjoy yeah. anyway. <laughs> Do you think the engineers will be more weirded out by the pamphlets references or the St. Augustine references? I'm not quite sure. Hey, uh, if you're an engineer listening to this, you know where to email us, podcast at Betakit. 
tweet us at Beta Kit. We, we want to hear from you. I, I'm looking forward to a question about that in our next AMA episode. So stay tuned. <laughs> The Beta Kid Podcast is produced by Beta Kid Incorporated. It's edited by Katie Lohr, and its hosts are Rob Kennedy and me, Douglas Saltis. To learn more about how you can support this podcast, head to patreon.com slash betakit.